I would like to introduce Professor Adolfo Bronstein, who is Argentinian, working for many years in London, where he's a consultant in Wern Square and chief of uh, neurotology in Imperial College. Um, he will take a, a very interesting topic, which is the pronostics factor after acute vertigo. Thank you, Adolfo, and welcome. Welcome, Adolfo. Welcome, everyone. Stage is yours, Adolfo. OK, thank you. I will, I will share my screen now. So thank you, uh, thank you everybody, um, Sergio, uh, Asef, and Sudhir for organizing this course. Um, uh, first, I want to remind people to mute themselves off, otherwise we can hear all the all the celebrations there in India. Um, uh, incidentally, happy Diwali to people in India and every everywhere in the world. Uh, celebrating Diwali. So um, my, my, my job today is to um, try to establish um, a few um, uh, factors that may be um, important in, 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 in making a prognosis af after uh, a, an episode of vertigo. Um, because as we know, there are long-term uh, symptoms in many uh, patients, and it would be nice to begin to understand why this is. So um, as you all know, um, it is um, uh, with this scheme that I think I always face my patients with vestibular symptoms with three uh, uh, presentation episodes uh, of single vertigo episode, which is what we're going to be talking today, episodic vertigo like um, vestibular migraine, BPPV, many disease, and chronic dizziness. Um, of course, the one factor stopping patients with acute or recurrent vertigo developing chronic dizziness is this um, wonderful process of central vestibular compensation. So this is, um, this is a, a slide of uh, eye movement recordings of somebody with a permanent right-sided uh, lesion and showing in the, in the dark this left beating nystagmus here. As you can see, um, this nystagmus is very visible in the, in, the, in the dark, but not so visible at all in the light. Uh, and this in, indicates a first stage of vestibular compensation, which is visual suppression of the, of the nystagmus and the imbalance. But note that this wonderful process, even within a month of, of, the, of the permanent lesion, so there is virtually no nystagmus in the uh, in the absence of visual fixation, so in the dark. So it means that there is an initial visual phase of suppression and compensation, and then an, an internalized uh, 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 process which allows the subject to compensate. So because this is such a, pr a complex uh, and a multifactorial uh, process, I'm just going to list here a few of the factors that uh, may contribute to interfering or delaying vestibular compensation, which is another way of saying these are factors that make uh, patients continue with long-term uh, vestibular or dizzy symptoms. One of them, of course, is the presence of a fluctuating vestibular disorder as opposed to the patient who has a single episode. I mean, the, the, the case I show you of the patient with the right labyrinthectomy, um, you know, he has a very rough week or two, but after that he compensates because the deficit is permanent. And that is usually the case for our patients with vestibular neuritis. However, if you have a Meniere's disease or vestibular migraine, uh, recurrent symptoms, you know, make the process of, of central compensation uh, much more difficult. Um, another factor interfering with vestibular compensation is the presence of additional disorders. Um, in particular, central neurological uh, problems. Um, we all know that if you have an additional cerebellar problem added to your peripheral vestibular disorder, the chances of the brain compensating for that peripheral imbalance are diminished. 
And in particular, um, this has been shown by Adam Edge. Uh, if you actually have um, the presence of uh, a, a background small vessel disease, the microangiopathy of the elderly, which we consider normal, but still uh, interferes with brain function, that um, delays uh, vestibular compensation. Lesions in the peripheral nerve system, because of course we also need a good proprioception in order to balance ourselves. Problems in the cervical spine, because after all the process of compensation requires the subject to be able to move the head. And if they have additional cervical uh, spine disease and cervical pain, they will not move their head and accordingly they will um, delay the process of, of, uh, of central vestibular compensation. Similarly, visual disorders of various kinds. Um, if, 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 if a person or an animal is blind, the, the actual suppression of the nystagmus is much more complicated and sometimes impossible. And in terms of um, minor visual, this common vestibular visual, visual disorders, we have, of course, um, uh, problems in the elderly, the elderly with cataracts, um, uh, uh, patients with um, uh, minor or subclinical disorders of binocular conjugacy. So it is good sometimes in patients with a delayed uh, vestibular compensation to do the cover test and try to see if you can uh, elicit the presence of a skew deviation or any uh, uh, exophoria that actually may need additional uh, correction. Uh, lack of mobility, you know, uh, in, in the old days, the main reason for lack of mobility was uh, iatrogenia, because most doctors used to tell their patients to stay in bed until the symptoms uh, diminish or even disappear, which is wrong. You have to uh, encourage the patient to move as much as possible so that they can uh, compensate. Drugs, excessive use of um, vestibular suppressant drugs like chlorpropamiracin, dramamine, any of those drugs, they can be used for a couple of days, but they should not be left uh, in, in long-term uh, treatment. And it's, un it's unfortunate that many patients do so. Psychosocial factors, of course, the patient with additional psychological problems or social benefits of appearing to be ill. Uh, and this, this factor that may be new to some of you um, that we call visual dependence. Visual dependence means um, that some subjects are more dependent on vision to um, negotiate the world, to navigate, to, um, uh, to uh, orient themselves in space and to balance than others. So these people who need more visual input or so-called visually dependent people are more exposed to developing this long-term uh, syndrome of visual vertigo. What is visual vertigo? It is one of the complicating factors in, in long-term vestibular patients. And um, it can be de defined as an increase in vestibular symptoms produced by visual stimuli. Um, sometimes repetitive fences like this one, buying things in a supermarket where they have, you know, a moving uh, frame of reference, they have plenty of optokinetic stimuli, often children and other people moving around the corridor. There is some kind of visual information overload that the patients refer, or specific visual uh, patterns that are also ups upsetting. So these are real examples taken from, from uh, uh, clinical interviews, supermarkets, repetitive fences, striped shares, these collides, etc., etc. There are not only urban um, uh, environments, you know, uh, rivers, clouds, movements of foliage, trees, etc., can also el elicit this, these uh, symptoms in susceptible uh, patients. Um, the issue of dizziness worsened by vision is an old problem. I mean, one of the earliest uh, references in the in in the, in, the mo in modern times is this paper by Hoffman and Bruckler where they describe some patients, I think with, a, with an acoustic neuroma who went on to develop a visual vertigo e effectively. And, and they described it as an under, underrated a neurological symptom. But it has had many names, spatial motion discomfort, visual vertigo, visual vestibular mismatch. And perhaps the term that we should all use is the one approved by the classification of vestibular symptoms by the Barani Society of visually induced dizziness. To be honest, this is the most uh, uh, efficient and, and, and more accurate term. Th these patients um, 
express an increase in their vision or a trigger in their, in their vision by uh, in, this, in the vestibular system by visual stimuli. How can this happen? Why would this develop in, 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 in these patients? Well, if you think of your typical patient with vestibular neuritis, and that's the paradigmatic example that I'm using to describe this patient with a single and prolonged episode of vertigo, you know that they can have vertigo, so for intense vertigo and nausea for three or four days. Fine, you know that. You also know that they can then be left with some dizziness, um, non-specific dizziness, perhaps less rotational for three or four weeks. And then you know also know that for three or four months, they can be left with motion intolerance. In other words, they don't like being exposed to movement. Either they don't like being exposed to head movements or they don't like being exposed to visual movement, to visual motion. And I, I always like reminding people that for those, you know, vestibular neurons in the vestibular nuclei, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to know what the, imp the input is about. That these neurons receive visual and vestibular input concurrently in the vestibular nucleus and the cerebellum, in the thalamus, in the cortex, almost everywhere in the neuraxis. And therefore, it is understandable that those patients who um, uh, 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 have had a vestibular disorder are hypersensitive to visual motion. When this process is uh, somewhat uh, increased or exaggerated, perhaps in those subjects who had already a background increased visual dependency, so that's how visual vertigo would develop. Uh, vision unbalance is a, is a long topic, which I'm not going to go into detail. There are a couple of, of reviews that you can see here. This is a book that actually uh, Asif uh, uh, put, put together. So um, uh, this is a, it's a plug for your, for your book, Asif, here. Uh, and, um, um, but I'm going to uh, show you a couple of examples um, of how visual control of balance is a strongly influenced, influenced by a number of components and factors. For instance, the visual control of balance is influenced by cognition, by visual geometry, by proprioceptive input from the ocular, the cervical, and the, and the peripheral a proprioceptive input, and different central structures, the cerebellum, etc., as you can uh, predict. I'm just going to show you a couple of these examples to show you how variable and how complex the visual control of balance actually is. The, um, this is, a, this is a, some experiment we did many years ago in which we actually had subjects recorded, you know, the postural sway at the feet and, and the postural sway at the head. And we, we were given a simple, you know, repetitive uh, rightwards or leftwards uh, uh, visual motion stimulus. And so this is the visual stimulus going to the right. And this is what the head does in response to a visual stimulus. It sways in the same direction of the visual stimulus. And, and, and the, the forces at foot level do exactly the same. So th this is the initial push of the feet. But the, the head and the body do exactly the same thing. They go in the same direction of the visual stimulus. If you have subjects here, not fixating directly on the background, which is projected, but on a window, which we placed in front of the subject. So creating what is called in visual science, visual motion parallax, then the response to the same visual stimulus was not just modulated, was completely inverted. So a rightward visual stimulus produces a head and body response in the opposite direction. So complete uh, uh, reversal of, of the response. Regarding cognitive, cognitive influence on the, on the control of balance, uh, Michel Garras did these experiments with us many years ago. If you actually have somebody looking at the screen, not knowing what's going to happen, and then the screen goes to the right, you have these responses, these visually evolved postural responses to the right. But if the subject himself delivers the stimulus with a joystick, and therefore he's aware of when and how and in which direction the stimulus is going, is going to go, then there is no structured, visually evoked postural response. So, as visual control of balance is strongly influenced by so many factors, I 
I've only shown you two examples, but there are many more factors that influence the visual control of balance. It comes as no surprise that visual input has such a very variable effect on vestibular patients. Vestibular compensation is a complex process. Part of that compensation is via the visual system. And because compensation and visual control of balance are so complex, we really have a bit of a difficult scenario there for, for the patients who are trying to compensate. So this is exactly what this, this uh, work showed when we, we were doing um, uh, visual vertigo patients. So if you actually measure effectively, this is the Romberg test, how much you sway with your eyes closed with respect to how much you sway with your eyes open and you test three groups of subjects. These are normal controls, which means you sway a little bit more with eyes closed than with eyes open. We all know that. These are patients with visual vertigo, minimal vestibular dysfunction, but a lot of this visual induced dizziness. And these are patients, LDS, we used to call them in those days, labyrinthine defective subjects. These are bilateral absent vestibular function patients, you see that their rhombar is a slightly more positive, so to speak. They sway a little bit more when they close the eyes. But interestingly, see what happens when we give them this visual stimulus here. You, you, I hope you can see my cursor going onto this um, uh, rotating disc here. At the wrist, th th this rotate, it makes people unstable. And in that case, the patient with visual vertigo sway more, not only more than the normal control subject, but even more than patients with no vestibular function. So this indicates how conflict between the visual input and the vestibular uh, or proprioceptive input in this patient with visual vertigo throws out of the, the, uh, out of the window any uh, possibility of, of uh, good uh, uh, balance control. This test you know, was simplified, we simplified it. So we have a laptop version that we've taken anywhere around the hospital, even to a, the accident and emergency department where we have a visual vertical line and, and, and dots that can rotate around the, the, the visual axis so that you can measure how much this line is tilted by the rotating visual background. So this is a measure of visual dependence, how much a moving visual stimulus destabilizes your perception of verticality. So, and, and you measure visual dependence or visual dependency as a subtraction between the error during the moving trial minus the error during the static trials. So that is visual dependence. You can download this and, and use it with your grandchildren, your children, or with your patients. So, um, so what does this show? In, in, in a cross-sectional study, when we had 20 or, or, or so patients, we actually looked at the visual vertical. So this is the static error. In uh, We had 16 patients, uh, 18 patients at the time. As, as you can see, you know, there is no big difference between these patients who are in the top um, um, uh, third percentile of the DHI. So these are the patients who are well compensated. And these are the patients who are very symptomatic for the DHI, for the dizziness handicap inventory, a questionnaire. So these are the symptomatic patients. These are the non-symptomatic patients. In the static situation, they are both equal. Once you get the roll uh, motion going here, the optokinetic stimulus, then those patients who have bad clinical outcomes show a massive increase of the tilt of the line. So it means that these patients tell you that they are upset by the visual motion. And in fact, you can actually measure how uh, upset they are by that visual motion with this simple test. Um, so poor outcome in unselected patients with vestibular neuritis is associated with high visual dependency. So we then did a prospective study of 40 patients with acute vestibular neuritis where we measured the caloric function vestibular psychophysics, symptoms with the VSS and with the DHI again, psychology questionnaires, because we all know that this patient's psychology is very uh, um, important in the, in, in, the, uh, in, in the way the patient present and, and experience these symptoms. And we measure visual dependence with that rod and this uh, test. Um, so when you have many variables, sorry, when you have many variables like this, 
the one way that you can understand how all these various factors interact with each other and how they all contribute to a final outcome is doing something which is called factor analysis. Uh, factor analysis allows us to see how different outcomes, predictors of, of outcome, group themselves. Because, for instance, if you were to do, for the sake of argument, a rotational test and caloric test, you know, that you are measuring kind of the same thing. And so those two factors will be, you know, grouped together, but that's not particularly useful. You need to know how the factors align themselves with other more um, uh, broad uh, uh, factors. So when we did this and we put all these variables in our analysis, we eventually identified two components which explain, which explain the, various, the variance in the data. There was a very strong first component which explains 59% of the variance. So this is nearly two thirds of the variance in, in our sample, which luckily, luckily, it included symptom score at the recovery stage. In other, world, in other words, how much DHI, the outcome at 10 weeks, the dizziness handicap in inventory measurement of symptoms and, and handicap in the patient actually loads quite highly with 0.71 here. What else is associated with this uh, a symptom score in the DHI? Okay, so we found that at the recovery stage, visual dependency strongly loaded on the same factor. The hospital anxiety and depression scale also loaded very highly. The body sensations questionnaire, I don't have time to explain, but it's a, it's a test which measures your psychosomatic tendency. So how, how likely you are to develop somatoform uh, symptoms and autonomic arousal from the VSS, which is a similar kind of how much attention you pay to your uh, autonomic, autonomic symptoms. So these actually lo lo loads together with symptom score and explains a strong percentage of, the, of, the, of, your, of your sample. There was a second component, which was lesser in important because it only explained 12% of the variance and of very significant note, it did not include symptoms. So this small component does not include symptoms. What does it include then? Well, it includes vestibular test, the vestibular perceptual threshold test, which is a psychophysic test of vestibular function that we do, and canal paresis. So this means that, you know, Vestibular testing directly express a little bit of the variance, but not actually associated with outcome in the symptoms. Before you shout at me, the same results take place if you use the VHID, because clinical outcome in vestibular neuritis uh, is not correlated with VHID gain or VHID asymmetry, and we published that as a separate as a separate paper. So. What best predicts clinical outcome in these uh, patients? Well, not the severity of the vestibular deficit, but a factor made up of visual dependence and psychological characteristics. So not the vestibular deficit itself, but the, the combination of visual dependence and psychological characteristics. The question here is whether these are two sides of the same coin, which I think they are. And I think it's a fascinating topic for anybody here interested in the psychosomatic component of, of, of vestibular disease. This will be a fantastic model to latch on to uh, because you know, visual dependence you measure with the visual vertical is something very physics dependent, but at the same time, that is strongly associated with uh, psychological characteristics. At the personal level, this is what made me realize that uh, the psychological factors are very important indeed in the prognosis of um, vestibular neuritis. This was part of the of the of the data that also uh, played a part in um, um, in uh, leading to um, a, some consensus document for the Barani Society where. Uh, we drew up the diagnostic criteria for this entity, which we call persistent postural perceptual dizziness, uh, 
or PPPD or triple PD or three PD, which uh, is, it that is, is, is the scenario of the patient that you are all familiar with, the patient who you told them six months ago, oh, don't worry, you had a minor vestibular episode, you're going to be all right, I'll see you in six months time. When you see them, the patient has not been able to go back to work, so his family is under strain, he is not able to actually go and, and, and drive the car because they get dizzy and they, etc. So that is um, um, the term PPPD is new, but the disorder is not, and everybody on this, uh, on this chat today is familiar with this condition. Um, the concept of PPD is based on 30 years of research on phobic postural vertigo, space motion discomfort, visual vertigo, and chronic subjective dizziness. Conditions that, in a way, you know, they, they all touch each other at the margins, but we we all found it difficult to understand. At the personal level, I was, you know, uh, 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 quite turned around by by my own data showing the strong association between something which looks very physical like the visual vertical and the influence of visual motion and the psychological outcomes. And I know that that was also so uh, the case for uh, Jeff Stapp, who is the first uh, and, and eminent author, uh, first author in this, in this paper. So this patient described dizziness and steady, usually non-spinic vertigo, and it is exacerbated by upright posture, hand postural, active or passive movement and exposure to moving or complex visual stimuli. In other words, they have a bit of visual vertigo. So triple PD is classified as a chronic functional vestibular disorder. Uh, it is not a structural or a psychiatric disorder. No point in telling the patient that there is this brainstem abnormalities in them or that they are uh, psychotic. No, it is functional vestibular disorder functional in two ways, functional in that there is a psychological component and functional in that it is the function of the system which is distorted, not the structure of the system. And this is what happened in your typical patient. If you actually plot here, I idealize symptom intensity or symptom load, and this is your patient with vestibular neuritis, and this is time, as you know, there is a massive increase of symptom within 24 or 48 hours, and then the patient very quickly begins to recover. This is your ideal recovery, uh, and this is what happens to, to most people who have vestibular neuritis. However, those patients with PPPD, they are recovering initially, and then they, re they recover less, and then they go up and down, so and they continue until a clever neurotologist see them at this stage and, and explains things properly. The same can happen in, in conditions like BPPV, in which you have multiple attacks, ups and downs of, of, of vertigo, but at some point the patient begins to experience long-term symptoms that also fluctuate up or down. And if you change BPPV, uh, by vestibular migraine, the same scenario uh, is, is visible. So um, clearly, as, as we've seen by the definition uh, 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 it, of, of PPPD, there must be at least some overlap between visual vertigo and triple PD, because you know, uh, visual vertigo is almost a diagnostic uh, criteria in PPD. Although I am 100% convinced, and when Jeff Stab was actually drawing up these papers, he actually spent three months in London in my unit, and I show him many patients who have visual vertigo, and they can have things like downbeat nystagmus aura without all the neuroticism associated with that. So there are patients without visual with visual vertigo which don't have PPPD, and there are patients with PPPD who don't have visual vertigo. I'm sure that you, you have all uh, seen this. The question is how much overlap there is between visual vertigo and Is it just a little bit of overlap like this? Or, you know, the vast majority of patients with visual vertigo and, over, uh, and PPPD overlaps very significantly. That I don't think we know at this stage and it's, it's a question worth uh, asking, I, I believe. So, um, the good news is that, you know, uh, this strong interface between the psychological uh, aspects of these patients and the visual vertigo in these patients is amenable to treatment. Apart from the psychological and psychopharmacological treatment, these patients uh, can be uh, improved by 
optokinetic treatment, either with a disc or with, you know, this is not even a virtual reality system. This is like a Walkman for watching movies when you are in bed. So this costs $200 or something like that. Or an optokinetic system as, as you have in your, in your labs. Um, and, you know, of course you improve uh, all the vestibular and visual vestibular symptoms, but I'm showing you only one slide of this paper, which compares the patient who underwent customized conventional vestibular rehabilitation and the machine based in which we did strong optokinetic stimulation in this patient. And as you can see, there is a significant difference at the end of the treatment between these two populations. But what I didn't tell you is what I'm measuring here is the pressure in these patients. So it means that this type of treatment without any pharmacological or psychotherapeutic uh, input also improve the psychological components of the patient. You can argue because they feel better when they go to the supermarket and they can go and do their shopping, then they begin to feel better. I don't know how it works, but I know that at the pragmatic level, it is a good way of improving both the psychological and the vestibular uh, symptoms. So that's the ocular stimulation. <clears throat> so the conclusions, and I think I'm, um, I'm okay, yes, I, uh, 19 seconds to go. Conclusions, um, visual control of balance is influenced by multiple central interactions, including cognitive. So multiple interactions in the visual control of, of posture. Hence, there is a wide range in visual postural control in the, in the normal population and in the patient population. Chronic vestibular patients develop visual vertigo with excessive visual dependence. Factor analysis shows that visual dependence and patient psychology drive poor prognosis. The good news is that visual vestibular therapy improves both the visual vestibular component and the psychological component. This is not, I'm not advocating against sertraline or psychotherapy, no but this adds both components as well. Prognosis depends more on central factors than on the severity of the vestibular lesion. This obsession that we have to know if your patient six months down the line, the canal paresis is 30% or 60%, it's very interesting, but it's pretty useless from the point of view of predicting outcome. Vestibular tests, old and new, in other words, calorics, overheats are excellent for diagnosis, but not for prognosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adolfo, for the excellent talk. Um, we use the chat for questions. Okay. So if somebody wants to ask you something, you can read it in the chat. Uh, we're, okay. I don't see any question. I don't see any question. Too many people celebrating Diwali, I think. And yes, also. Yes, hello, yeah. Jorge. Hello. Oh, that was great. I, 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 very, very good. Can you tell us how migraine plays a role here in visual dependence? Yes, okay. Um, we. we I, I'm not sure I have figures with me, but we all know as clinicians that migraine produces um, uh, a lack of tolerance to a number of stimuli and visual tolerance is clearly less in patients with migraine. Um, this has been known for you know, many, many decades uh, and, and in, including um, uh, op optokinetic experiments um, that uh, can uh, induce discomfort in, in patients with migraine. I'm not talking about vestibular patients, just conventional migraine. And, 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 and that sets off a number of, of, of complications in people with migraine um, who include unusual things, even reductions in the tolerance to pain. So migraine people exposed to optokinetic stimuli, if you try to measure pain objectively, quantitatively, they, the, the, the threshold goes down. So um, in other words, that's why they complain so much of so many things. 
So that's one 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 level. Um, in 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 uh, in vestibular in vestibular migraine, I suspect this is worse, but this is only clinical clinical impression. At the time of these experiments, we actually measure uh, migraine, uh, and um, and migraine did not reach like a statistical threshold to be one one factor in that uh, in that uh, factor analysis. But uh, at the clinical level, I am fully convinced that uh, migraine plays a part in, in, in this. So thank you, that's an important question. I'm sure you, I'm sure you share the answer. Thank you. Uh, we, we had a question from a, a resident, Dr. David C, asking about- uh, uh, I, don't, I don't talk to juniors, I don't talk to juniors. <laughs> can, can you read the, the question? Can you open the chat? Anyway, yeah. Um, I, I have it. Uh, I have. It. Thank you, Adolfo. What overlap do you see between vestibular migraine and visual vertigo by Michael Texeda? So that's not David Z. Um, and so um, the question, the, the answer to this question, uh, was partly, uh, uh, you know, uh, touched on uh, from my my previous my previous answer. So. Um, I am sure that vestibular migraine um, um, plays, that's our clinical experience, a significant part in the in the in the visual vertigo in this patient. However, remember that the data, the actual data that I presented, was not based on, on patients with vestibular migraine. It was, in fact, vestibular migraine was an exclusion criteria. So we we wanted patients with vestibular neuritis and no other. And complications. So um, there is a, a lot of overlap and migraine and vestibular migraine predispose you to, to visual vertigo. I, I did publish a, a paper on that separately showing that, you know, um, the patients with vestibular migraine uh, do not experience the uh, reduction in visual dependence that you uh, produce in a normal person. So when you give them visual stimulation, so if I, you know, if, if I measure your, your rod and this test and you have a, a tilt of say 10 degrees and then I expose you to the treatment. So then your, um, um, your, uh, your threshold comes down and you only tilt by two degrees. In patients with migraine and vestibular migraine, that doesn't happen. These patients do not have the capacity to adapt or habituate to visual motion. So they, 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 they're permanently um, over sensitive to visual motion stimuli. But, uh, well, there is, a, there is a question from David C. Can you read it? I can see it. I, I saw Michael okay. take the question. This one is visual vertigo seems rare in many patients with cerebellar disease. It is true, and if so, why? Um, I don't think it is extremely rare in patients with cerebellar disease because, you know, in my unselected, in my first paper, which I think is 1995 in, in JNNP, um, one or two, I, I would have to say, but definitely one because I, uh, I used the figure of one of those patients, one or two patients had cerebellar disease. Uh, one, was, one was, yes, and I remember, now was a, a brainstem cerebellar stroke, and another one was a, a patient with a cerebellar degeneration. Um, the, other, the other comment is the patient that I was uh, anecdotally mentioning that when Jeff, Jeff Stab was in my lab, um, he used to come to the clinic and I show him this patient with, you know, typical downbeat nystagmus, the broad by gaze, and you talk to the patient, complete visual vertigo, complete, you know, kind of, if he didn't have the, the downbeat nystagmus, and the atrophy on the MRI scan, you would say this patient has PPPD. So I, I, I'm sorry, Dave, it's, it's always very, very dangerous to disagree with David Z. We all know that. Um, yeah. uh, but I, I don't think it's that uncommon uh, in, in patients with cerebellar disease. I don't think that we ask them, but if you ask them, uh, Dave, please tell us. Okay, we are perfect on time, but time for uh, only one question from Manuel Gallardo from Peru. What proportion of patients with peripheral disorders develop visual vertigo? I, I, the, the short answer is, I don't know. 
the long answer is when I started my research on this like five or seven years ago, uh, uh, I used to, I, I was very convinced that I was going to see lots of patients with vestibular neuritis then developing uh, visual vertigo. I was very wrong because we, we were seeing these patients every two or three weeks for research purposes. If they had any questions, we would, you know, uh, ever, uh, you know, answer those questions. In other words, these patients felt, felt protected, they felt looked after, they felt interesting, or, or at least that the clinicians were interested in them. And the proportion of patients who developed a visual vertigo was much smaller than, than my previous experience. I would have thought that from those 40 patients with that uh, initial episode of vestibular neuritis, uh, five, six, or seven um, did develop um, uh, like clinically uh, visible uh, visual vertigo. It depends on what you do with them. This should be the moral of, if this is going to be the last, uh, the last answer and the last question, the moral is, if you feel that your patient is slightly vulnerable psychologically, or if you knew that this patient was visually dependent and you, will, you begin to realize that very quickly after the illness, these patients need to, uh, need to have much more visual vestibular therapy than your average patient. So concentrate your efforts on these patients from the psychological and from the visual stimulation point of view. Thank you. Uh, one more uh, question. Do we have one five seconds, little short time? Yes. Are you in the car, Asif? Uh, so, yeah, I got... <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I heard your lecture from my car. I was just so, uh, the, but in meantime, I got kicked out. So now I am, I just parked at the gas station. Anyways, so um, while I was reconnecting, I missed part of, I, I heard your whole lecture, but I missed the question answer session, first part of it. I don't know, Dr. Asprella had a question. Did you answer that already? I don't no, know. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Can I quickly ask his question then? His question is, Thank you, Adolfo, for excellent lesson. Is there any link between visual vertigo and any cochlear symptoms? Uh, thank you, Jacinto. I, 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 I cannot answer from the data because these patients really had truly and purely vestibular neuritis. Uh, and therefore, uh, I, I, we, we, we did not experience this, this problem. Um, uh, in, in, in other patient populations, like with vestibular migraine and so on, I, I, I cannot comment. It, it specifically, I just get the impression that the patients with visual uh, and vestibular migraine, when they get, when they get um, these additional symptoms, the threshold for pain, as I described a moment ago, the threshold for tinnitus goes down, the threshold for er everything goes down. They just feel rotten and miserable. So this is not a scientific question, it's a, a scientific answer, I'm sorry. The question is scientific, the answer is not very scientific. From my data, I have no, I have no answer. From clinical impression, I, I, get in, I, I feel that everything gets worse in these patients when they are going through a dizzy or through a migraineous phase. Sorry, cannot answer better than that. Thank you, um, thank you Adolfo.